And so, yeah, we're going to talk about SSH client tricks. This is the bookend to the very nice presentation that Jared gave uh, last month. It's uh, uh, posted up to YouTube and covers the server side part of it. But of course, that's only half of the, the equation. So uh, let's go ahead and talk about the client side this week. Okay, first, I, I always start off with an introduction for those who are uh, absent-minded and forgot who I am. I am a uh, Andrew Denner. I'm a software developer by day and a sleepless diaper changer by night. Somehow, I still remain the president of the LUG. Uh, we, we can have a Thunderdome uh, fight afterwards if anyone wants to take it over. Trust me, I, I'm a wimp. And uh, yeah, I have social media stuff, depending on where you fall on uh, Space Terran's uh, website or not. I, I've chosen not to take a side, and I'm on both. And then uh, this... Uh, Elon <laughs> uh, yeah, so anyway, the slides will be posted afterwards, as well as this recording. So yeah, if it's a Wednesday night, the third Wednesday, this is the Central Iowa Linux Users Group. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about SSH uh, client side stuff. Just for some level side leveling of stuff, the server side that I'm going to be connecting to is running Ubuntu Jammy. It's just a plain Jane stock. It has... Uh, RQ and uh, um, also has uh, X org running on it for uh, part of this because, of course, uh, you can't pipe uh, any of the other fun graphical stuff across the wire like you can uh, nicely with X here. And uh, client side, uh, we have a fun toy that apparently can't do HDMI out, so which is why we're uh, screen sharing from it, uh, but this is a uh, Debian VM running on Chromebook. Uh, it's whatever the latest beta is, and it actually surprisingly works and can do exporting. And uh, I'm actually kind of surprised because why? Why not make life a little bit more hard for me? Is that an ARM Chromebook? No, it's a uh, Intel. Because that would be even more impressive. <laughs> it's just ego, man. <laughs> yeah. So, so my old ARM Chromebook is no longer. Yeah, I, I did have Prosh running on my old uh, Chromebook uh, that was uh, ARM, but it's no longer getting security updates. And you know what? For the the uh, price of one uh, Benjamin, uh, the, this thing really wasn't. Uh, worth equivalent over security or anything like that. And plus the, the battery had started swelling on the other one. And uh, yeah, I, I like spicy batteries, but not that much. So let, let's just quick touch a little bit on the uh, history of uh, SSH. Uh, it stands for the Secure Shell Protocol. For anybody who was around way back in 1995 and actually was using computers at the time, I, I was uh, an elementary kid who uh, li liked to use uh, uh, play Oregon Trail, and that's about as far as I got. So, but uh, basically, uh, at Helsinki, there was this uh, uh, packet uh, sniffing attack, and uh, someone listened to someone type over Telnet their password and then was able to get access and kind of ticked off the researcher who uh, got hacked. So he fixed the problem and wrote his own uh, SSH. Also around at the time was Kerberside's Telnet, uh, Project Vincent uh, at Iowa State or Project Athena at, uh, it was California. Uh, UC, like UC Berkeley or something? I think it was Berkeley. But they basically, they, they had Kerberside, Kerberside's Telnet, which basically took the, the Telnet, encrypted it, and piped it down uh, a Kerberos wrapper, encrypting everything. And yeah, it, it's as bad as you think it would be. 
but uh, yeah, Iowa State at the, the time when they, they cloned everything up until the mid 2000s had uh, Kerber sized everything. So you could have uh, K pop, which is more than just good music, it's also Kerber sized uh, pop three. Uh, as well as just, it, it's a real pain to make work on a Windows machine. But yeah, so anyway, though, but fun story. Uh, basically, after a while, uh, they, they found out that there were all sorts of minor little security holes as well as not nice to have in uh, the, the actual uh, version one of it. So they released in 2006, uh, version two, which uses Dippy Hellman key exchanges, and you can also have multiple sessions and data pipes over one uh, connection. So it's a nice improvement. So how do I get it? Well, if you're anybody, you probably already have it installed on your machine. Otherwise, just apt install open SSH client. Uh, if you're uh, one of those other people that, that use uh, uh, that, that other package management, yeah, you Google it. I, it's probably not my fault. Yeah, you, Red Hat probably installed it on there just because they're they're nice people. Uh, Windows now even includes it by default, so there's no reason to have to download Putty, even though it's still being updated. It is kind of nice if you can't remember how to use. Uh, all of the different little pipes and etc. But yeah, otherwise, yeah, you don't need it. And it's just yet another thing to go wrong. But so let, let's just start out here with uh, uh, man SSH. Let's make that a little bigger so those in the back can see. It'd help if I can type. So here we have all of the different options that you need. And this is basically part of how I, uh, most of what I based my entire talk around was just looking up the man page. So let's say, for example, if you want to force uh, it to use uh, IPv4, you just do dash four, dash etc. Uh, it's all there, it's fairly self-explanatory. But uh, let's just sort of dive into the anatomy of your commands. They we're going to break out with examples here in a little bit. But so if you want to do SSH, enable a verbose, verbose mode, it will throw a whole bunch of stuff at you. And most of it is useful only to someone who's a uh, SSH client software developer, because uh, it's, there's a lot of stuff there. And uh, other than looking cool to all your hacker friends, yeah. Uh, dash four or dash six, depending on which flavor of IP you're at. Unfortunately, the host we're connecting to uh, does not have IPv6 on it because yay, uh, IP or the ISP doesn't actually provide that. So yay. Uh, but hey, they're fast, so I'm not going to complain. Uh, if you're one of those uh, dash six people, yeah. Just do it that way. Uh, dash X will give you X1140. Uh, basically, you can take uh, your, so remember uh, with X11, it, the client is on the, the machine that's actually drawing the pictures, the, or actually running the program. The host is on your local machine showing you the pretty pictures. So remember that it's uh, reversed, but it will basically, uh, yes, I know. I did uh, not know that, okay. But it will allow you I didn't know that X11 was backwards. Yeah, so it will yeah. allow you yeah. as an X11 server to connect to an X11 client and uh, view the images that are there. So if you're yeah. the docs, it, it's you like to go like yeah, <laughs> it, it's like doing accounting debits versus credits. They're the reverse of what you think they should be. But anyway, the but a fun little back there. Uh, dash Y is if dash X doesn't work and you need to do the less secure version of it. Uh, it's the, the trusted, you, you know that the, the person you're connecting to is not going to do bad things to you, but yeah, they, they could beat you up and steal your lunch money. So use with caution. 
uh, dash D is for uh, port forwarding. We're going to dive through a whole uh, example here in a bit and uh, show you how you can get around your corporate firewall with, of course, a proviso that uh, they, your security guys will notice you have the page out and they could come and rubber hose cryptography you into getting uh, what's going on there. Uh, you can also forward ports from your local machine or from the from the server side onto your local machine or vice versa. Uh, you can enable compression and there's a whole host of different settings that you can use to pick which algorithm you use, etc. Uh, the username, of course, uh, that's whoever you are. Remote server, that's who you want to connect to, either the IP address or the DNS, and then whatever command you want to run on the other side fairly easy. A lot of these are optional. Uh, port 22 is the, the assumed standard port that everyone uses, but you don't have to. So let's dive into trick uh, number one here, using a SOX proxy. So the, this is your at, uh, say, a school or something, and the net nanny won't let you get to hacking.com or something like that because, oh no, hackers. So, uh, but they will let you SSH out to the world. It's real easy. You just do SSH dash capital D, what port you want it to be on. And then uh, you have to go into your web browser and tweak some settings here. So let's just go ahead and do that. So I am going to SSH to uh, my favorite machine here, which is just one I stood up on the, the home internet connection. And I type in my secret password here very badly. And you know what I forgot to do? Was adding the port. Yes. So we wanted to do, sorry, here, uh, dash capital D. And let's just go 6666. And I log in, and now all I have to do, and of course this is the web browser, so yay, eh, that wasn't thought out well, but here we are. Uh, so if we go into settings, and we go, do I believe- Watch it kill your Zoom call. Eh, yeah, that could be a problem too, but, uh, so we go to privacy and security, I believe it is. Probably search for proxy. Yeah, let's just search for proxy. No, that was wrong. Connections. Well, okay, maybe in Chrome. So the, this does yes. work. So yeah, the, this does actually work in uh, normal web browsers. I wonder, is this in? Uh, do we need oh, apparently it's a system setting on a Chromebook. Yes. So anyway, system setting here. Thank you. Uh, so if we pop over here to. Device, keyboards, display. Let's just go proxy settings. There we go. Okay, network proxy. Here we go. So proxy, you go uh, manual configuration, socks. Local host and 6666 because that's a great number. And then we just go save. And then we're uh, connected. And if I just go to 10.8, uh, 
Yes, I know my cert is not safe because it's just the free one that came with the NAS. And there you can see we're connected to the NAS that's sitting at my house uh, over socks. So we'll go ahead and turn that back off so that we're uh, not going to lose our internet connection when we turn off our connection here. And we'll keep going to the next uh, tip here. Okay, back to presenting. So uh, yeah, uh, and that's going to be annoying. So uh, the other thing that you can do is you can use the application proxy chains. If you have an application that doesn't uh, play nice with SOC, like say your email client or our desktop or something like that, and you want to route it through your SSH connection. So like say, for example, if you want to do a Windows remote desktop, that, that would be a great way to do it. Now, of course, uh, the, the issue is that anyone who's watching their internet connections will know that you made an SSH connection and they, they can go and uh, ask you, what are you doing? And depending on what, what level of person you've ticked off, they of course can always uh, invoke the, the rubber hose uh, uh, cryptography uh, decryption to figure out what you were doing. Uh, what uh, talk would be uh, complete without a uh, XKCD joke here. But yeah. So anyway, though, you, you, you won't be completely invisible, but they at least won't be able to tell what you're doing. So trick uh, number two, if you want to do uh, SSH tunnel, where you have one port on uh, the remote side that you want to bring over onto your uh, local connection. Uh, for example, here I want to uh, connect into my uh, NAS box and uh, tunnel uh, the secure uh, ports over. Now, the one problem with this screenshot, uh, Chrome and everyone else have gotten clever. So if you try to connect uh, SS or a uh, HTTPS connection, to a non-standard port, like say 6666. Uh, in theory, it should work just fine, but in all practicality, you'll get a error message and you actually can't uh, uh, get back out of it. It happened for Edge, Chrome, and Firefox. So yeah, everyone's talking to each other and you have to pick a uh, actual real port uh, that's like, known and loved like AD, which uh, is what we're going to do here next. So let's just go SSH-L, which will be the uh, host port locally, so AD80, and then we want uh, who you want to connect to on the remote side. So 10.0.0.8. You could do local host if it's the machine you want to connect to, et cetera. And then 443 is, of course, uh, HTTPS. And then you want to connect. Two one seven one forty two and okay, so then you want to just go to rather than ten dot oh dot oh dot eight, you can go to local host now and it should work just fine. 8080. I notice that we're still using HTTPS. And here we are with the big scary. Uh, this is uh, not the certificate, which is to be expected. And here we are connecting again to uh, my NAS box. You can do the same thing for, like, say, 
uh, oh, anything from like NFS, the Samba, whatever you want to pipe across there, it's great if you use the dash C compression, uh, especially if you have a very chatty uh, protocol, it will help over the wire make things better depending on how fast your internet connection is. But yeah, so anyway, though, that, that uh, takes care of that one. You can also do a reverse tunnel. So like, say, if I had a web server running on this local machine here and a VM out in the cloud somewhere, and I wanted to do a poor man's uh, Cloudflare uh, tunnels uh, sort of project, I could take my local web server and make it appear out on the internet for the low, low cost of like five bucks a year or something like that, buying a real low end box uh, and doing all the, the heavy lifting locally. Uh, Another fun trick with that, if you have boxes that phone home and you want to be able to SSH into them, you can you can do that that way. That's my primary use for it. Yep. So uh, the next trick here is so you have a local SSH key that uh, you want to copy out to your machine. Uh, yes, you could go into uh, slash home or tilde dot SSH and grab the file and copy it across and etc. That, that assumes that you're going to get it right. You're going to remember which files you need and all those things you're going to do right. It absolutely sucks and it's just a pain to do but you can use the command ssh dash copy dash id and the name of the machine you want to send your keys to and uh, it will prompt you it will tell you what key it actually checks and sees okay what keys are already up there of yours etc and we'll do the right thing uh, and it just magically works as an aside let's go ahead and just generate a key uh, first, let, let's talk a little bit about my, my favorite uh, uh, key standard, which is ED25519. Uh, which is the elliptic curve one that isn't. Uh, uh, so why, why do I love it? It's fairly new. It's kind of cool. And it's uh, faster to use and generate uh, and just all around compared to the old key standards. It's mathematically more secure uh, than uh, your old uh, generated RSA keys. It has a lot more collision resilience. The, the keys themselves are smaller. And uh, odds are that the NSA didn't actually uh, game the system and uh, cheese the numbers like they did with uh, P256 which is the, the key curve that is not, basically it's still around. In theory, you can use it. It, it all depends on uh, how, how paranoid are you and you think that uh, they're out there watching and listening, which they are. Uh, and it also is now tentatively approved by the NIST for uh, use in like secure government key things. So they, they trust it. Uh, so anyway, though, let's just quick generate a key to show how fast it can be done here. So we need SSH keygen. Yeah, in there. ED. Justin asked, what was the copy SSID? Again. Uh, so we'll, we're, we're going to uh, get back to that here as soon as we generate a key to copy onto the, the server. Okay. But uh, uh, can you use it to send your key to a different user on the machine? Not yes. Just you, a different user. Yep. Uh, we'll, we'll basically, all you have to do is when you uh, put the remote host name in, if you do the username you want to send it to, at remote host, bam, magic happens. Mm -hmm. So let's just save it as a default, no password, because I can never remember my password anyway. And there we go, it's generated. You don't have to wiggle your mouse or type or do anything else. And there we are all done. So let's go ahead and copy that up to my home machine so that I don't have to keep typing my password because 
I'm getting really tired of doing that uh, over and over again here. So let's go copy ID. So SSH, copy ID. And this would be the point that you type in your username if you, it is different from your local one. And then at and your uh, host that you're connecting to. So uh, 65, 104. Yeah, that's right. Uh, 167. 167. Dot 142. Dot 25. Dot 85. Oh, yes, I'm already there. You just it, you just haven't connected from the specific thing before, apparently. Oh, was I having you re verify the fingerprint? Oh, no, the issue is I generated the keys on the, the remote side. <laughs> oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> It's going to be one of those days tonight. Uh, yeah, apparently I was still connected to the, the remote host when I typed that. Uh, my SSH to my shell, so I'm on the Yo, I heard you like SSH for your SSH. <laughs> yeah, so uh, let, let's try that SSH one more time back. here. SSH. SSH back. Uh, you know, the part I found funniest was that your random art image in your slide was left aligned, and this one's right aligned. I never have an alignment on my random art images. They always just appear random. <laughs> You've got left alignment and right alignment. So ED255, one, nine, let's create a Okay, there we go. And now let, let's uh SSH copy ID of one sixty seven dot space one sixty seven dot one forty eight. Uh, Okay. And there you can see it's figuring out what keys to send and etc. Type in my password and boom. Now we go. Oh, so if you already had one key there, you could still, and it was restricted to key based login, you could still use the command to transfer all the other keys. Yes. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fun. So, okay. And I exited out of my terminal. But yeah, so anyway, though, if we just SSH over there, just to prove that it works. And let's do verbose. There you can see it spit a whole bunch of stuff out, but you can see how it's trying. It's uh, uh, offering the key, it got accepted, and we're now connected. And everything works. And yay, magic. So anyway, though, I will happily exit so that I don't make that same mistake again. Okay, so you can run remote commands. Uh, for example, if I want to, uh, let's take out our, so, just run a command on a remote machine without actually having to log in and do anything else. There you can see it executes and we're done and we run. And apparently, for whatever reason, the Iowa State Network is dying uh, before I get to it. There are firewall tweaks or something. Anyway, though, as you can see, we bounce out onto the cogent and yeah. So anyway, though, you can run that. 
Uh, you can also do it in bulk if you want. Uh, GNU Parallel is great. So uh, the fun story time, a uh, long time ago, I was admin of a rack full of computers that used to be a Beowulf cluster. The head node died, and they were like 900 megahertz machines. So they were barely, thankfully, the uh, university was paying for uh, the power bill and not the actual department that was running the stuff. So we just kept them running, and they were nice machines to uh, SSH into if you wanted to run stuff. So there were like 10 or 12 machines. And just running app update on, or app get uh, update on them was onerous and obnoxious. So we set an SSH key to be able to SSH in as root and uh, uh, on each machine, and then used uh, parallels to uh, run app update, uh, app upgrade uh, by brute force across all of them at once which was great because we built that uh, 100 megabit line going out and uh, <laughs> I was just wondering about that market uh, 56 days. So, so the fun thing was there was a 100 megabit drop in the room and uh, we, we found there, there was a, a Debian year on campus to the uh, Department of Energy, but their firewalls were so slow that it was actually faster to connect to the internet to <laughs> out the UNI year and pull it down across the state uh, um, where we could saturate the 100 megabit line for all of the nodes. And nobody ever noticed and no one ever complained. So it was worked great. Was your backbone between those, the ICN? Yeah. Yes. Well, okay, that, that made sense then. Yep. So anyway, though, uh, to install parallels, you just run apt install parallel, and it works great. And then you just basically, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes, it's the US Department yeah. of Energy Labs. Yep. So, so yeah. In, anyway, though, uh, we'll, we'll skip over running this command just in the interest of time because we, we've got a bunch more to get to. But basically, you just uh, you can either do all of your commands in a text file that you want to run in parallel, and uh, each line is another thing for it to execute. So, uh, example, you could do uh, in your text file, you could do SSH root at foo, update SSH root at bar, update car, dar, foo, et cetera, all the way on and down. And that, that's a great way to script up if you have a whole bunch of stuff you want to do at the same time, like say uh, transforming uh, images into uh, smaller images or uh, transcoding MP4 files. You, you can actually set the amount of parallelism, all those sort of things. It's a great app, way outside of the scope of this presentation, but it, it really is a lifesaver if you want to make your uh, CPU turn into a coffee cup warmer. So parallel in and of itself doesn't care whether it's SSH or something else. It, it, this isn't like proxy chains where it's an SSH extension. This is no, just this, this is uh, just okay. a uh, new executable that will take and run whatever you want in multiple threads or and, in multiple uh, executions. So if you wanted to, so in your commands.txt, you would need the full SSH command. So yes, if, okay. you, if you're then, doing that version, if you're doing this where you just want to SSH onto right, right, a right. list of things. You say parallel dash i percent, which means hey, take whatever thing. But yes, you could test it, but you're you're insane. Uh, okay, yeah, uh, we're gonna do it. But but yeah, basically this dash i says hey, take one of whatever, or take take whatever command you see here, and go ahead and inject it into wherever I have a percent sign. Max args means I'm only taking one. If you have two, you could have take take two. So you take the first one, put it into the first percent, the second one into the second percent. So say like you're renaming something or wh whatever, you could do that. And so then uh, SSH root at whatever this machine name is and run this command. So basically, you're just doing the same thing over and over again, writ large. It's a great command. I recommend all my friends use it. Uh, so you don't need to use SCP. You really should. 
but uh, if you just want to pipe something across the wire, you, you truly can. Uh, so like say if you do uh, uh, tar compress uh, this data folder and go pipe, you, you can just pipe it as an input into the remote server and then just uncompress it on the other side. You can, there is no error correction and uh, really there are far better ways to do it than that, but why not? Essentially, when you're using the uh, kubectl uh, cp command, that, that's essentially what it's doing under the hood is just tarring your files up and sending them to the other end and untarring them. The, the part about tar is really going to, if, if, if you do barge something up, it's only between the two uh, header sections that it's going to kill it. Yeah. But so anyway, though, they, there is no uh, like error correction or anything like that. I, I believe yeah. TAR has error correction for the headers, but that's it. Yeah. So anyway, though, they, there are better ways of doing it, like rsync or SCP. I, I recommend doing that instead. But just as a proof that SSH doesn't really care, it, it will happily uh, copy anything else out. Like, say, for example, if you want to just copy uh, files from a local machine or from a remote machine and dump them onto a bzip file in your uh on your local machine you can do that as well why you want to is there a special dd syntax yes I, you, you I, I was this whole slide i've been thinking i have successfully cloned computers using dd over ssh I've been, I've been, that's <laughs> when i forgot when i forgot a different data storage medium i have used and i have an ethernet cable on hand I did not have a terabyte hard drive on hand, but I had my USB sticks with Ubuntu on them. I booted up live crossover or used an Ethernet as a crossover and cloned a computer with DB over SSH for the to view the uh, champion. We have been doing this entire uh, we've been in the long term um not argument but discussion of that his way is better than my way for purchasing. But yeah, so yes, you can just DD your disk remotely using just purely SSH and DD. As if DD wasn't scary enough. <laughs> okay. like, do I have the right device on the right side of the SSH? <laughs> the one thing I would recommend with this is if you're going to do that, use the dash capital C to enable compression because DDing, you're going to be copying all the empty bytes too. And yeah, which is why you should just use Mozilla, head of which uses the uh, file system smart. Uh, Can you use on SSH on localhost? Yes, you could. That's so you could do you could do a you could do a, if you have files with a bunch of zeros in them. But why would you want to use SSH on a local host when you could just use a local pipe? Because the copy command doesn't know about it. Oh, well, then you're, you're thinking about explaining SSH for its compression to copy a file with a bunch of zeros to a different spot on the same machine. Well, then, so, then you're doing a file per file and you're skipping the point of DD, which is to do per set, per block or block. block. The, easy, uh -huh. the, the better way to do it would be to tar it, copy, untar it in that case, rather than using SSH in the memory. Yeah. Be, because the thing to remember about dash C is that it's over the wire compression, but it's decompressed on the other side. Yeah, it's not file level compression, it's stream level compression. And also I will point out like SSH is, a, even if the CP is still kind of slow. Yes. Yeah, you, you're going to be burned the, the encryption cost as well as flying across the wire. None, none of any of these things that I, I'm showing are performant uh, as performant as running it locally. But oh, 120 whatever per second, if I remember right. Like it was, it was just hair over the 800 mark that I was expecting for you today. But yeah, so the, the better option is to just use SCP or RSync, uh, which uh, the Syntax for that is fairly easy. Uh, so if we go, let's just go echo. So 
generate a file here and then it's SCP. Which is probably just SFTP underneath the hood nowadays. It really is, yeah. And there we go. As you can see, it's really easy. Uh, our sync is even better. I, I think we've all been there. I I didn't know that you didn't need a full path. And so it just uses uh, whatever your default is. Apparently, I I what didn't know that was a thing. You know how many times I've added an extra like. 15 characters in front of that to spell out slash home slash username slash yeah. So anyway, though, as we click install our sync because it doesn't come by default here, you can do the same thing and man, I'm gonna start using that that way more. I don't know that's the thing either. As you can see, it didn't do anything because it. Yeah. So, yeah. So, anyway, our sync's uh, so much better because it will actually compare is that file already there? If it is, it won't actually do all the work for you of copying it across. Unless it's changed. Unless it's changed, yes. So, uh, you can actually do Vim over SCP. This one kind of blew my mind. And so the command is vim scp colon slash slash remote host and the name of the file you want to edit. Oh. So. This is actually an actual SCP? Yeah. Well, it's. It's kind of the actual SCP protocol. So it's SCP on the other Yeah, it's a little discouraged. Vim, so. Oh man, now we're getting into the fun stuff. So yeah, uh, here we are. Uh, oh, it's complaining about your URL syntax. Yeah, so. Let's just. See if we can figure out how to quit then. Quitting yeah. <laughs> them eventually. Well, I should close the terminal tab. <laughs> I just want to quit. <laughs> I don't know that I've never broken anything <laughs> like this before. <laughs> this is actual good, not me over here. Yeah, so the trick's a little thought. But I'm going to have to open a different tab because <laughs> I done broke it. Larry well, asked if there will be a slide back of this available after it's the trick yeah. 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 yeah, not necessarily of the live demo. Well, uh, no, we're recording. Yeah. No, we're recording it. Uh, I'm going to be turning off uh, the, the port forwarding to the this IP address as soon as I I uh, get done with this talk. So. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, uh, give by and SCP colon and slash slash. It's just oh yeah. Yeah. Okay, so here is that file that I SCP oh, across there. And so then we can continue to edit it. Hey, you can edit it, save it, and SCP it back. We're all good loggers to modern loggers. Okay. We use loggers. I know, but so as you can see. Lunchers. And it just copied it across. And if we take a look at it again here, uh, 
right? There it is. And so that, this one was the one that just sort of blew my mind that you could even do this and it worked. Would it support like SMB as well? You know what? I honestly don't know. I'm <laughs> like, who can put other things in front of there? Yeah, I, I don't know. Well, uh, are you asking if VIM supports SMB or if SCP supports SCP. SMB or if SSH supports SMB or if they all are supporting each other? Yeah, probably, yeah. You can find your question. So, so with SSH, you could do SMB over SSH to tunnel it uh, from uh, your uh, remote network onto your local host. Yeah, I was talking like in BI yeah, putting SMB. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, you can also just install uh, the Fuse uh, SSHFS and just edit it like that. It's dirty. I don't really want to sully this machine with that and have to power wash it up. Yeah. So anyway, though, you can mount SSH sessions. It's a beautiful thing. We need to do it. Oh, when you have to, it's amazing. Uh, it also, if you just use NFS, it will be faster probably. Or uh, uh, Zamba or whatever. The use case. Use For your question, curl does support it. Thinking of you wouldn't have NFS. Yeah. So the, the one biggest one that I did learn in this is that there is an escape uh, key that you can exit if your SSH connection is uh, somehow hosed and you can't uh, get out. Uh, they, there's two ways you can do it. You can either uh, you can set up in your SSH config uh, your server live interval. It will just basically send an echo down the pipe to see hey anybody there uh, every five seconds. And if it doesn't respond after one of them, it will just kill your connection. That that can be a good or a bad thing. Uh, and of course, you can tweak those. Uh, the live interval is in seconds. So if you want to set 60, if it has an answer in 60 seconds, or if you want to ping it every minute or every second, and if it fails after five, five of those, well, then I know it's dead, et cetera. Th those can be tweaked, but those are just edited in your SSH config. Or if you're in the middle of a connection here, you can actually escape with uh, the escape sequences. So if you type uh, the tilde, uh, that, that is the escape uh, sequence that will let you send commands to SSH itself. And uh, so let's just go ahead and make a connection here. And let's go ahead and exit. So if we go and just SSH here to my favorite remote machine. Yeah, I'm getting some new ideas for securing SSH part two. <laughs> so uh, if we look at my slides here, basically you can ask it, well, what, what escape sequences do you uh, accept with tilde question mark? So let's just go ahead and type tilde question mark. And there you can see it gives you a list of things you can do. You can either send, uh, you can tell it to die if you put a period. Uh, you can send it a break command. Uh, you can request a rekey. So basically, you just trigger the, the handshake at the start of your connection all over again. Uh, you can turn up the logging level. You can suspend it to the background. So your local client, you can jump to the background connection or bring it to the foreground or whatever like that. Or you can send uh, the escape character. So if you actually want to send the tilde, uh, and just tilde to the remote machine, you just go tilde tilde, and it's like any other escape thing, it will only chuck one of them actually down the wire at you. So let's say I've somehow totally hosed the connection, I can't get out of it, I'm, I'm mashing keys, nothing's happening, I just have to type tilde, type tilde period, return, and there we go. Uh, so it doesn't actually show up in the, uh, the that was my problem is I've had tilde tilde period. Mm -hmm. And so I got nothing found. So, so tilde to the remote machine. Yeah. Right? So yeah. So any, uh, I said tilde period to the, the remote machine. Yeah. I said, yeah, command line found. 
So as you can see, that's a great way of escaping if something's locked up being the remote side and you can't get to it. Uh, everybody knows Screen or Qmux. We, we can have night fight out in the, the parking lot afterwards, which one yeah. you like, because it seems like everyone loves one and hates the other or hates one and loves the other. But uh, there's a whole talk that you can give on the Uber abilities of using Qmux or Screen to be able to both uh, keep a, uh, a, a shell running on the remote side if you have a long running process, or if you want to pair a program, you, you can have multiple people connect to the same uh, shell, or you can have someone watch as you're typing. Uh, all those sort of things are totally possible. The screen is a great thing. And I remember several years ago, the just utter knockdown drag out fight that was on uh, the, the mailing list, I believe, because somebody was screaming and hollering that you had to call it to new screen instead of screen because, yeah, so. <laughs> One of those black people. <laughs> yeah, someone had very strong feelings about it. Uh, exporting, you can uh, send, you can run something on the remote side and send it to your local machine depending on how fast and how latency your uh, internet connection is, this will either be a fun, great thing to do, or it will absolutely suck. I've done it a few times and uh, it can be very painful sometimes. Yeah, so not trying to use Firefox to watch YouTube over <laughs> the weather forwarding connection. I like to get upgrade. Like <laughs> around the school proxies, okay? <laughs> So if you want to use XIs, you can see that it's uh, forwarding on. And it's fairly performant, but we've got a fast connection and really it's only going across town here. So it works, but yes, you could do Firefox. So what would your command be if you wanted to see the XS program on this screen follow the cursor on the remote screen. You couldn't, uh, oh, okay. because uh, XIs is running on the X server of your local machine. And so that's where the mouse command right. is being captured. There's not a, but then what's happening on the remote? It is not screen? remote desktop. It is not, so never, it's the opposite of remote desktop. In essence, your session is just that exported session. It is not. In, in fact, the machine we're running. connecting to doesn't even have a graphical desktop running. Or does it have that? It can have one, and then you, the one you start can be attached to that one, or it can, by it default, it's a separate one. Yep, it's a second. Yeah, so there, there's no reason to actually have to have a full desktop running on the remote machine if all you want to do is forward Firefox. So let's say we could go uh, sudo because okay, so the exercise was running on the, the remote machine. Hey, yes. Yes. Yes, but the the graphical part of it, uh, it was sending the graphical commands from the uh, X client onto my X server, which is running on this machine, which is where the mouse is being captured by the X server. Yeah, the other different. machine doesn't even have a uh, mouse connected to. Here's a different example, like X client. Yeah, like yeah. Oh yeah, you're because you're using the. Uh, no, no, that still throws me off with that size. Everything else makes sense, like the clock and the, the Firefox and all those make sense, but X size, man, that one throws me off because of how it handles mouse input and whatnot. Well, I mean, Firefox is exactly the same. It, it's capturing your mouse clicks just the same. Right. When you're scrolling up and down with Firefox, or your mouse oh, throws on, on the remote, or do you, you follow the current local? Okay, so oh, while that's installing, it is on your local. The only that's in remote is for that X session, not the 
But if it was fully on your machine, then it wouldn't work as a proxy bypass because Firefox is actually running on the remote machine. So you could use that to say, get into his NAS. Right. So it's not completely running on your machine. Well, so the, <laughs> the keyboard might not need to be real. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah. yeah. He has to edit the, the recording now because <laughs> yeah. Fine, but the typical thing. Uh, what means. So, so the biggest tip that I have about thinking about X org and how it works is just don't <laughs> stop, stop thinking so hard. <laughs> we see the way oh. overthinking it. And Wayland, uh, yeah. So that's the problem. Wayland actually won't work for this. That's another discussion. And yeah, that, yeah, that, that's a whole other thing. But one of the problems with the XOR is currently uh, I don't have any sort of audio being forwarded. So let's say if we want to watch Ferris Bueller's Day Off. <clears throat> that's a good question. As you can see, audio output failed. And this is where you can see the, the utter potato uh, performance that you're going to get from trying to do graphical X over. And of course, it's throwing all sorts of errors because uh, audio doesn't work very well. But it, as you can see, yeah, it, it's. Uh, uh, <laughs> But yeah, so anyway, though, we'll, we'll stop that before we end up getting uh, copyright claims or anything like that. But so, so that's, that's the question, though. If you're doing X11 forwarding, is the crime taking place to play copyright and content? <laughs> Which device is the crime taking place at? And if it crosses state lines, does it become a federal issue? <laughs> I'm sorry, this is a legal issue. Are you on federal records? <laughs> I agree this from the post office. Um, if it does, if it does the errors, it's similar to that rough one. <laughs> yeah, so I, I have installed uh, Firefox here. So it, as you can see, we we can, but again, it, it is rather painful to actually run anything really remotely over uh, SSH using X, which is why you use uh, NX or uh, our desktop or one of those sort of, uh, well, oh, because I'm connected to it on another uh, screen as well. You, you can really only forward one, one thing at a time here. So if we do Firefox, you'll see that it will fire up here eventually. How well has the X11 protocol been fuzzed? Um, see, I, I run into this all the time with X11 forwarders. Or be a hazard because it's a lot of it's like it's a lock of what a cop so yeah. Okay, so yeah, apparently th this is one of those cases. Oh, where... it's because you haven't done a first run. Firefox on first run puts a bunch of like session stuff there that doesn't oh. exist. And I bet you that's also if you're it, when it mentions the wrong authentication, I ran into this lock forwarding displays back in the day that something with if the displays don't line up properly like the number colon number thing then you can run into issues or if you're using sudo you can run into issues because root and your user have different session cookies and yeah so anyway though it's fraught with pain uh it's not something that i'd want to do on an everyday basis uh x uh rdp or something like that is so much uh, more suited for long term remote use. Uh, but you, you can do it. And, and as I was hinting, yeah, there, there you can see where it's throwing all sorts of errors. But if you're running it on a, a local LAN network, it worked. The, the video streamed. It, but, I used to do it all the time on campus. It was fun. Yeah, yeah there yeah, was a time fun. where X11 forwarding. With <clears throat> accelerated uh, TPUs on both ends, because you could take the XLX CD network and put it more than Windows boxes than the the RDP at the time because the, the yeah. code for acceleration wasn't in the NX or RDP. 
Oh yeah, they, there are perfect reasons why you want to do it. However, doing it across a remote internet connection, across the, the wild internet, you're going to have a bad time. If you try and send anything overly obnoxious, like streaming video. What is the internet? Fast enough. enough. It, it's fast enough. Are we still on that DSL connection? I, I don't know. It's easy enough to find it's out. Cheap fiber. Uh, fiber. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, so anyway, though, we'll, we'll dive into that here in a second. Uh, first off, uh, as the hip lanes already began, uh, any cool, cool tricks that I missed or didn't uh, uh, include in the slide deck for the 30 some odd slides that we've uh, powered through here in the last hour and a half? Can you show me a proxy chain's live example? Because I still don't understand it. They're actually talking about this on set case. KC right now. So uh, pro proxy chains as in connecting anything uh, like proxy chains. Are you talking about oh oh the, the application proxy chains? Uh you had an example on like slide four, I think. Yes. But we didn't actually do it. Yep. So uh that was farther than that, apparently. You're, you're talking about proxy chains there. Yeah. Yep. So uh First off, you well, whether or not we do our desktop with it, I just I'm, mm -hmm. I'm having trouble conceptualizing that. Yeah, so sorry here. Uh, yeah, so basically, proxy chains will wrap whatever command you want to run it in and use it uh, to run uh, uh, a basically to a SOX proxy. So here, let's go ahead and here's okay, yeah, we're good. Is this uh, yes, uh, person on the line. Maybe an accident. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, so what we want is dash D and six, 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 and then. Seven down to two to twenty five, uh, eighty five, and we're connected. And then let's go at pseudo app. Also, oh, it's also a separate program. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then looking at so if we look and the proxy chains and the program name. So we do port number, okay. So we could do okay. So we could do uh, trace. That's so it worked without the port number. Kind of. Looks like it. I'm. Okay, so. Yeah, this is where we just need a quick. Uh, 
This is where we pull up the documentation because I've used it years ago, but I honestly don't remember it off the top of my head here. Okay. For configuration, you need a Soxy chain. Oh, or is dash F? It was up like four okay. minutes. Yeah, so that, that's where it's using. Uh, oh, so you can config file for it. Oh, okay. Yep. Okay, cool, cool. That's fine. I was I was thinking it was just some command line tool, like the parallels or like the the R sync or whatever that you could just like do the thing. I didn't I didn't realize it was a whole separate thing that just used an existing proxy port. But that's good to know. I'm going to play with that. Okay, looks like here is. Okay, this is what we need to do here. Proxy chain sock by. So if we do CDC SSH bypass. Uh, uh, I don't think it'll work, but you have to use a uh, F a corkscrew to uh, yeah. the H yeah. over HDB proxies. Yeah. Size five equals six six. We just need to build another batch from house with a web terminal on it. Just HTTP off on it, call it the weekend. But yeah, so ba basically that's what it's doing is it uh, is piping whatever thing you want to run, uh, which of course, oh, we, yeah, since we don't have uh, trace route, uh, so we need a pseudo app. Wait, did it still trace path? Uh, what is that in these days? App search. Up to utilities trace path, of course. Well, if you want to trace route, I think that's the BSD utils. Not to be confused with tracer T or just plain TR or NTR. Okay, so here we go installing that. And apparently it really, really doesn't like. I'm wondering if this is part of that uh, fun little VM that this is actually running in, not playing nice with any of this, but. Yeah, so in theory, though, uh, this is what you could use to to pipe uh, for some program that doesn't uh, uh, behave uh, quite so esoterically. Yeah, there's some glibc hackery ism. But no, that's 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 plenty for my purposes. That'll that'll definitely get me get me on the right track for doing the shenanigans I was hoping to do. Yeah, which I just wonder. Yeah, it's definitely not not playing nice at all with the, this uh, little sock puppet of a VM, which is fine. Proxy sock puppet. <laughs> yeah, so I can see who. Okay, uh, stop share here. Oh, it's us. Yes, the, the echo, echo, echo. I guess I was thinking of the video, 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 but. And then if we just hit stop. 